one of my employees did not show up for work this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Okay. Uh, which is totally uncharacteristic of her. She and her boyfriend are splitting up and he can be a real jerk with her. This is one of the most shocking cases I have ever investigated. It involves things that no person or animal should ever witness or experience. A truly difficult course of events to break down and present to you. This is the tragic case of Tina Herman, Cody and Sarah Maynard and Stephanie Sprang. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to those that knew and loved everyone affected by this case. Tina Herman, a mother of two, Cody Maynard and Sarah Maynard, was born on February the 13th, 1978. Tina's biggest joy in life was being a mother. She appreciated the simple things in life. Her favourite flowers were sunflowers and she would collect figurines of dolphins. Daughter Sarah was born in April 1997 and son Cody was born on September the 16th, 1999. Both were good in school and participated in multiple athletic and sports teams. Cody Maynard was described as having an enormous heart. If he was to notice bullying, he would put a stop to it. Sarah Maynard was described as the epitome of bravery and an inspiration. Tina was by this time divorced from her children's father, Larry Maynard. At that time, he was living in New Jersey with his new wife, Tracy, and their son, AJ. After moving, Tina Herman quickly became best friends with another mother in the neighborhood, Stephanie Sprang. The pair became inseparable. Stephanie was also a mother of three. She had a bubbly personality and was always smiling. The most important thing to Stephanie, too, was her children. They lived in a county of Mount Vernon called Knox County. County. At the time, it was known mainly for its agriculture. It is surrounded by parks and lakes and its residents are known to be friendly people. It has a population of over 16,000 with a tight-knit community feel. It is located around an hour's drive from Columbus, the capital of Ohio. On the morning of Wednesday, November the 10th, 2010, Greg left the house for work at around 3.40 a.m. that morning. He was working at the Target Distribution Center outside of Columbus. This was around an hour-long drive away from the family home. Greg wasn't planning to return home for a few days. He had plans to stay at a friend's house nearer to work and play some golf and hang out. Back at the house, Tina Herman, now aged 32, was getting her kids Cody, aged 11, and Stephanie, aged 13, ready for school. Cody and Sarah left for school and attended their classes at East Knox Middle School. After the kids had left for school, Tina left the house before 9am to run some errands. Boyfriend Greg had sent Tina a text message when he left for work, and he received a reply at around 11.30am. Tina explained in the text message that she had fed the family dog, a miniature pincher called Tanner. Tina had a scheduled shift at work at 4pm at the Dairy Queen in Mount Vernon. She got on well with her co-workers and had a good attendance record. She was not one to just not turn up. She had also planned to meet with her neighbour and best friend Stephanie. They were going to house hunt for a new home for Tina's family to move into. Between the time that she sent the text message to boyfriend Greg and the time she was due to start work at Dairy Queen, Tina had her whole day planned out. The home where the family lived was fairly isolated with few neighbours living in the area. When Tina returned to the family home after going to the store, she discovered that she was not alone. Shortly after entering the house, she was struck in the head in an attempt to knock her out. This attempt failed. In an escalation, she was then struck multiple times in the chest and back with a sharp implement by an unknown man in the master bedroom. 
Coincidentally, during the attack, neighbour and best friend Stephanie entered the family home. Stephanie rushed to the master bedroom to check out the loud noises that she could hear. After seeing her best friend being viciously attacked, a distraught Stephanie started to yell. She too was attacked by the assailant in the same way as Tina. The attacker struck her in the chest repeatedly with a sharp implement until she was no longer breathing. After both women were tragically lifeless, the intruder began and dismantling their bodies in the bathtub of the family home. Their beloved family pet, Tanner, was present throughout the event. He would not stop barking as he saw his entire world being torn apart. The man then shockingly ended the life of Tanner in much the same way. The barking could have been drawing attention to the scene. The attacker then put the bodies of all three into trash bags. He then attempted to clean up some of the mess in the house. During this time, Cody and Sarah had returned home from school on the school bus, taken a short walk home and then entered through the front door. As soon as they entered the house, the assailant jumped at the startled children. He struck 11-year-old Cody in the back of their head with a sharp implement, sadly ending him in an instant. Instant. Although Cody had already passed, the crazed assailant then continued to strike him. After witnessing the unbelievably harrowing attack on her brother, Sarah took this chance and fled to her bedroom in an attempt to escape. However, she was unable to flee from the living nightmare that had become her reality. She was chased and caught by the man. By then, he had already taken four precious lives, but for dark reasons, the man decided to spare the now shattered life of Sarah. He tied her up with a cord from the fan in her bedroom. He then carried her downstairs to the kitchen where he gagged her and left her to wait. He returned to the horror in the bathroom, disposing of Cody in the same heartless manner as before. With three people now packed into black plastic bags, the man carried them out to the garage. Here, Stephanie's jeep was parked. He loaded the bags into the boot of her car. He then returned to the family's kitchen to blindfold Sarah and placed her in the car with the bags. Just a note for me, I find this just so awful. It's actually impossible to imagine what this experience must have been like for Sarah or for any of them. I guess maybe luckily at this stage, she didn't know the full extent of what had or what was about to happen. It's just really, really awful. The man drove Stephanie's Jeep around a mile away from the house. At this stage, he changed to his own car, a Toyota Yaris. During this time, Sarah was unaware that the lives of her loved ones were now over and they were now in the bags placed beside her. The man transferred Sarah and the bags into his own car and then drove Sarah to his home. Upon arrival at his house, he locked Sarah in the bathroom. He then left for a period of time and disposed of the bags at a site far away from his home. When he returned, he decided he needed a nap. He then tied Sarah to him, fearing that she might escape. Sarah now took a chance to look around. She saw that her kidnapper's home was strangely filled with leaves. The walls were lined with bags stuffed with leaves and the floors were completely covered with loose and bagged leaves. It's hard to imagine just how surreal and confusing this whole thing would be. In yet another heartbreaking moment, when the man woke up, Sarah was intimately violated multiple times. Back at the house and in the community, the absence of the family did not go unnoticed. Later that day, Tina's manager at the Dairy Queen grew concerned. Tina had not turned up for her shift. Not only that, but she had not heard anything from Tina that day at all. This was not normal for her. She called Knox County Police and reported the unusual behavior. Sheriff Barber's office. Hi, my name is Valerie Haythorn. Uh -huh. And I work out at Dairy Queen. I'm the general manager out there. Uh -huh. One of my employees did not show up for work this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Okay. Which is totally uncharacteristic of her. She's one of my managers. Okay. I drove out by her house and went and knocked on the door and left her note. She's not answering her phone, which is totally uncharacteristic. She's not answering her texts, and she is not at home, but her truck and her coat are in the house. Her truck's there and her coat is in the house. I'm very concerned about her. What's, you know, what's her name? Her name is Tina Herman, H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N. -N. Okay. Uh, I know that she and her boyfriend are splitting up, and he can be a real jerk with her. Okay. Do you have a phone number for her? Um, oh, God, I do, but it's in my phone. I'd that's, have to call you okay, back. Okay, that's fine. What was your name again? My name is Valerie Haythorn. Okay. Okay, I will uh, have a deputy swing out there and check on her. 
Okay, I appreciate it. Thank Anytime. you. Anytime. Uh-huh. All right. Bye. Bye. Following up on the report, the police arrived at Tina's home twice to check on her. They visited once at 8pm and again at 11pm. However, there was no answer and they noticed nothing unusual. At this stage, there were no grounds to enter the home. Tina's lack of contact was something that the manager just couldn't ignore. She drove to Tina's home herself the next day on Thursday, November the 11th. She wanted to get to the bottom of this growing mystery. The first thing she noticed was that Tina's car was not in the garage. And when she looked into a window of the home, she noticed that something was not right. In a decision not taken lightly, she broke a back window accessible from the yard and entered into a nightmarish scene. She discovered an excessive amount of spatter around the house. She searched through the home in an attempt to find some answers. While in the bathroom, she came across a bizarre marking in the bathtub. It was a rim of a red substance around two inches high in the tub. She immediately called the police again and told them what she had found. This is Deputy Sylvia, can I help you? Yes, this is Valerie Haythorn. Uh-huh. I called in last night about Tina Herman being missing. Uh-huh. I am out at her house now. I just went in her home because I'm so worried about her. There is blood everywhere. Okay. Where are you at? I'm sorry. I, I, I just got back today, so. Okay, okay. So I you just need to kind of fill me in a little bit, okay? Tina Herman works for me. She did not show up for work yesterday, and we have not been able to locate her or her children for the last it's been 24 hours now. Uh, I just spoke with No, I'm sorry, ma'am. Okay. I just I'm need sorry. an address. I just need an address. 481 uh, Kings Beach Drive in Apple Valley. Okay. Just give us a few minutes and we'll ha- we'll be in run, okay? Okay. So Don't go you. back in the house. I'm not going to I'm staying in the driveway. Okay. Thank right, you. No All, right. All right. Bye. 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 After gaining approval from Tina Herman's boyfriend, Greg, the police entered the family's home. The deputy sheriff noticed the family pet, Tanner, was not at home. Whilst trying to unearth answers as to where the family could be, the deputy noticed a man sat in a car across the street from the house. He asked the man what he was doing there and to see his license. The man told him that he was waiting, waiting for his girlfriend named Sarah. Not knowing what to make of it, the deputy let the man go. However, he did make a note of this strange encounter. A manhunt was immediately called for as the police continued to investigate the Herman family's home. They located Tina's pickup truck, which was found seven miles away from her home near Kenyon College. Police called Tina's boyfriend, Greg, in for questioning. Greg was at work during the time of the disappearances and afterwards he went to buy beer at a nearby store and then went golfing, just as he said he would do before the incident. He was captured on CCTV and it was clear that he was not the suspect that they were looking for. Greg was quickly released as he had a solid alibi. Police had found a Walmart bag which contained heavy duty black bags and a tarp at the family home during the search. They checked the product codes on the items and after matching these to store records, they were able to verify the date and time that they had been purchased. Police officials then identified the man who had purchased these items by checking checking the surveillance video at the store. In the CCTV footage, they were also able to see this new suspect driving his Toyota Yaris when leaving. After checking records for people who owned a Toyota Yaris in the area, they finally found their suspect. It was a man named Matthew Hoffman. 30-year-old Matthew Hoffman was once a tree surgeon. Police obtained a search warrant for Matthew Hoffman's Columbus Road home on November the 14th. Quickly after accessing the house, they found Sarah Maynard tied up and gagged in his basement, still alive. Under the circumstances, a 13-year-old girl being held captive for four days by a total stranger, uh, I would call her the epitome of bravery. While the police continued to search for the missing family members, Matthew Hoffman was arrested for kidnapping on the 15th of November. Everybody's, you know, worried about what's going on. Everybody's scared, wanting to know, you know, is everybody okay? And everybody's just worried, mainly. There's a lot of thoughts running through my mind, and I guess all we can do is pray that they come home safe to everybody. For neighbors who live near Hoffman, the news that 13-year-old Sarah was found just steps away is disturbing. It's, it's really scary knowing that I could spit on this porch from my house. He's just weird. He, uh, 
he doesn't go to the grocery store. He's very paranoid. I know that he was very, and he only had two friends in one year that I've seen come over there. He was fun and stuff at first, and then recently um, he choked my friend, and um, that's when she she told me not to let the kids over in the yard, and this was like a month ago. Hey, Matt. Matt. Roger Brown, I'm a detective here at the sheriff's office. Okay. Okay, you want to take your hat and stuff off? Coat? All right with you? If I take them cuffs off and put them in the front, is that going to be a problem? All right, let's do that then. Well, Matt, can I just stand up here for me? Can you turn around here and just face the wall for me? Okay. Do you kind of understand what's going on here, Matt? That's it. We can explain all this to you if you want to talk to me, okay? I think you know what, we're, what we want to talk about. But we need to find some, find some people. Matt, can you hear me? The only reason that I don't know where Tina, Stephanie, and Cody are is because we had to spend a lot of time at the scene. Okay? We will know. We will find them. And if it's going to come to it that it's not with your help, then so be it. But I'm going to be the first guy to tell the jury that. I guarantee you. But I sat in an interview room with this guy. And all he wanted to do is close his eyes and blink him until I walk out of the room. And then he opens his eyes and gets his drink of water. Now, am I a prudent person? What kind of person do I think that is? You know, other people, there's family members out there of other people, and they all they want is closure. That's all they want. They've been up for days like you and I have, you know? I, I don't understand sign language, man. Is that your heart? You're saying heart? Broken. Your heart's broken because of what happened? No? Someone broke your heart? I don't want to hurt anyone. It's not me. You know what antipsychotic medication is? Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't. I read about it. It doesn't directly address the problem. Mm -hmm. It's just powerful. Tranquilizers. Take it if I have to. I don't want to be a teacher. That's kind of crazy. Why do you think that? Because I must have done something bad. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. Wow, that can be worked through. Okay, potentially I can't, you know, guarantee these things. What facility you might go to, you know, where you might go, what might happen. And the, and, the, and the attitude that the people in the system are going to take toward you can be affected by the fact that you decided at this point to do the right thing. From the moment we broke into your house, found you and found her in the basement, you owned it all. You own it all. Okay? You can't do anything about the part of it you own. And, you know, you, I mean, you, if you didn't have a plan and you just put them in the Jeep or you just pulled over somewhere, there's weeds in the Jeep, so it looks like it's probably pulled into a field somewhere, and that's how the weeds got on there. If it's a random place, give me an idea where a street it might be on or off of. But you've got to be able to narrow the field down from the whole county. And the dumping itself has to be less traumatic to recall than all the stuff that went on in the bathroom. Just, just tell us where to look. And I will stand up in court and say that you did. And I will, I will go, I will go to Sarah myself and tell her that you did it. Okay. I don't want you to get upset, but the reason we're driving around, and we don't have to drive around, okay? Remember, I came in here saying that I didn't want to drive around unless there was some value in it, okay? Right, that's the whole point, is will you see something that will, you know, prompt your memory? But I want to talk about, I want to talk about what, what the possibilities would be for that location. Okay? In other words, not across the street. You're not going to put bodies across the street. 
what would you do, you know, from there, you know, if, in terms of a place you might go? Matt, we're not going to be mad at you if you don't know exactly. Your memory is not exact because you you have said that you want you want to know. You're afraid to find out, but you but there's a part of you that wants to know. If it doesn't happen genuinely, then it doesn't happen. I'm not going to be upset. You know, drive you, let you see, and, and kind of see what happens. I mean, I ask you, or Chris may ask you an occasional question, but that's all. That's all we're trying to. Okay. Good. Okay. Do you want to use a picture? Sure. For a water, do you like water bags? Should we take a water suit? Yeah. Right, do you want to go to the bathroom before we go? Are you good? I think I should go. Okay. Then I walked out with you. Okay. Hoffman appeared on a video arraignment on the 16th of November and was given a public defender. The judge ordered for him to be held under a $1 million bond. On November the 17th, after several days of searching for the missing family, the sheriff announced his concerns that the three missing people had most likely had their lives cut short. However, they continued their search to find them, holding on to hope. Matthew Hoffman, in a plea agreement to avoid the death penalty and with one very strange stipulation, finally gave the police, family and community the answers that they were looking for. He informed them that the bodies of the family could be found in a hollowed out tree in the Kokosing wildlife area. It is highly unlikely that the police would have ever found the bodies without having Hoffman tell them. The hollowed out opening of the tree stood around 35 feet into the air. The strange stipulation requested by Hoffman was that the tree must not be cut down. During his trial, it was mentioned that he had a noticeable interest in trees, perhaps an obsession. Hoffman also proved to be an unreliable witness. His admissions regarding his treatment of Sarah during her time of captivity were conflicting to the statements of Sarah and other evidence. He stated that he tried to make her comfortable, fed her, and treated her with respect and dignity. However, these were simply lies. During the trial, Sarah bravely stood up to her kidnapper, the very same man who had catastrophically taken the lives of her family and friend. The judge listened and her relatives weeped as the prosecutor read a letter the young girl wrote to her attacker. All I was thinking about is if my family was okay and if I was going to be able to live. Especially when he was putting the ropes on me, I said, ow, that hurts. He said, I don't care if your arms and legs turn purple. Justice will never be served. I will never be able to get my mom and brother back until I see them in heaven. Matthew, I want you to know that you will never be forgiven by me. But I'm not scared of you, Matthew. I'm going to stand up for myself and live my life. Hoffman never looked up, not once, as more family members spoke. Before you rot in hell, would you be treated and tortured as you have done our family members? Before the judge sentenced Hoffman to life in prison without parole, his attorney spoke for his client, who again, never looked up. This was a random burglary that went terribly, terribly wrong. It's tragic. I can't undo what it's done. I apologize. This was my daughter. Here, this is Stephanie. I'm trying to remember the, uh, the things that were and uh, bring them into the future with us, but it's, it's hard. It's very hard. Hoffman tried to spin a web of lies that the crime was a burglary gone wrong. Hoffman had already spent eight years in jail after burning down a condo that he burglarized in 2001. During the trial, Hoffman said, I did not enter the house to kill those people. I did not know a single one of them. I did not know their names and I did not know who lived at the house. I chose the house to break into because there were not any close neighbours and I noticed the garage door was ajar. However, all evidence led to a different agenda. Hoffman, who had a previous criminal record of burglary, arson and theft, had purchased the sharp implement days before the attack. Hoffman had already spent eight years in jail after burning down a condo that he burglarised in 2001. It was also brought to light that he had camped in a wood nearby the family's home the night before the attacks. In his confession, Hoffman told investigators that he did not take anything from the family home. Additionally, he stated that he had used black bags that he had found within the home. However, this is known to not be true. The bags were in fact the thing that identified him. When a deputy found the man waiting near the family home in his car, 
in a sickening twist, Hoffman was the man that said he was waiting, waiting for his girlfriend named Sarah. However, Hoffman was actually there because he planned to burn down the family home, destroying all evidence. Hoffman had already spent eight years in jail after burning down a condo that he burglarized in 2001. On January the 6th, 2011, Hoffman pled guilty to 10 counts and was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What could be done to prevent situations like this? Let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I am doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew. You too can become a channel member for just 99 pence. A huge thank you to my patrons. Your support makes a huge difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So thank you to Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Adi Alexander, Karen Jones, L. Palmieri, James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Crogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Cepheid Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Garthy M. Paler, Jeremy Sebrenek, and Darlene. Be careful out there, and I'll see you soon.